Hi guys, it's me. Um, so we are going to start part six of our book, Posted. If you haven't watched the previous five videos, make sure you watch them first because you will miss the introduction to all of the characters. Um, we've met a, quite a few interesting ones and now we're going to meet a new character in the book. So I am starting on page 44. I told you the whole thing started with Ruby Sandals and in a way it did but it was another girl who got the most attention. Her name, her actual name was Rose, like the delicate flower, though delicate, delicate is not the first word I would use to describe her. I know most of it, the war, the notes, the thing with Wolf, probably would have happened regardless, but without her, it would have gone so much differently. She came the same week that the school's ban on cell phones took effect. The same week Ruby was allowed to return to school after her suspension. The same week that my father wrote me an email telling me about the trip we were going to take next summer to Cape Canaveral. At least it wasn't to Miami for a ball game. Space shuttles and giant rockets were more up my alley. Rose Holland came that week and everything changed. There's a famous Alfred Hitchcock movie called The Birds. It sounds like a documentary, but trust me, it's not. In the movie, all the birds in this small California town go all avian apocalyptic apocalypse and start attacking people, plucking out eyes, blowing up gas stations, pecking everyone to death. Just about the same time that this one woman shows up, whether or not she's the reason the birds attack isn't entirely clear. It could just be a fluke, or maybe there is something about this lady that makes the birds batty. I watched the movie with Bench, who conked out about halfway through after muttering for an hour straight that any movie without at least one CGI character was bound to be boring. I watched it to the end, though. I wanted to see if the woman was going to make it out of the town alive or if the birds would get her. I won't spoil it for you, just in case, but I will say sometimes somebody shows up in your life and throws everything out of whack or just happens to show up the moment the out of wackiness starts. I wasn't thinking about the birds when Rose Holland appeared at school though, the day after the great confiscation. At the time, I was thinking about algebra. I had a quiz in second period, the dreaded Miss Shears, and had barely bothered to study. And then here comes the new girl, already six weeks into the semester, in two plus years, I had finally gotten comfortable with my surroundings. I knew who I could copy off of and who to avoid in the halls. I had the people I high-fived and the people I nodded to and the people I slunk right by, which was still most of them. Then here comes this unknown. That's what I saw when I looked at her. Not the girl from the bird movie, but a variable. Person X. Capital X. Because if there was one thing you instantly noticed about Rose Holland, it's that she was uppercase. Not big around like Mr. Jackson or like Sean Forsett, who looked kind of like a beach ball with limbs glued to his sides. Not even overweight, just big. More squared than rounded, like she had been constructed of cinder blocks. Of course, this was middle school. I was used to taller girls. But most of the girls at Branton who were tall were also skinny, like stretched taffy. Rose Holland was tall and wide, muscular, like bench. I figured she was an athlete, volleyball maybe, or soccer. She'd make an excellent goalie, practically impenetrable. Yet she walked through the hall the same way all of us did on our first days, with her eyes on the tiles below her feet, her frizzled brown hair lighter than mine hanging over her face like a veil, dark jeans and a black sweater that could probably fit two of Dee Dee. You could hear the sound of her boots from a mile away. Who's she? Bench said, standing beside me. Who knows, I replied. She looks like she can hit. Linebacker material. Be careful, I told him. She might replace you. Bench didn't have an answer to that. I glanced at the new girl again, noticing everyone step out of her way, only to give her a long second look after her back was to them. You'd be tempted to tell them take a picture to last longer. Except, of course, nobody had their phone on them anymore. Already. There were whispers trailing after her, though, and you could tell just by that brief walk down the hall that she was going to have a tough first day. I muttered a short prayer for her under my breath. 
I'd stay out of her way if I were you, Bench remarked. I snickered, though it was really more of a grunt as I pictured this new girl bowling over everyone in the halls, leaving smashed Play-Doh versions of them stuck to the floors with only their eyes bugging out. It wasn't really funny, but I'm a sucker for a good image. The new girl disappeared around a corner, looking lost. I shut my locker and headed to first period with a promise to catch up to Bench later. I met Wolf and Dee Dee outside the door to English. Wolf looked exhausted. Long night? George and Martha were at it again, he said. George and Martha were Wolf's nicknames for his parents. He says he got the names from an old movie he saw once about this couple that is always arguing. His parents' real names were Todd and Trina. There's something Wolf and I had in common, front row seats to the failing marriage show. Except where my parents mostly refused to talk to each other, his parents never shut up. His dad hadn't moved out of the house yet. I figured it was only a matter of time, but Wolf said it would never happen. His parents would never split. That would require them to agree on something. A strange thing was, I actually kind of liked Wolf's parents from the little time I spent with them. They seemed like nice people, and they seemed to like me. They just didn't like each other. Made you wonder how they got stuck together in the first place. You want to talk about it? I asked. I knew the answer already, but I asked anyway. What's there to talk about? Wolf said. I just wish they'd m let me move down into the basement. It'd be quieter at least. What about the piano? I asked. Yeah, would have to move that too. We ducked into class and found our seats. Dee Dee on one side, me on the other. Wolf in the middle where he belonged. All of us ignoring the dirty looks from the three boys who sat behind us. Normally, you'd get a comment from one of them, a completely unoriginal, here comes the dork patrol kind of thing, but today we managed to slip by. Mr. Sword finished scrawling something on the whiteboard and humming loud enough for the whole class to hear. Wolf leaned over and told me it was classical, Beethoven's pastoral symphony. I told him no self-respecting eighth grader should know that. Mr. Sword turned to us and started talking att taking attendance. He had just worked his way down the roster when the variable burst into the room. Sorry I'm late, got turned around, she said. Her face was red, flushed from running or embarrassment or both. Her eyes, I noticed, were deep blue like her jeans. She filled the door frame completely. It's all right, Rose, Mr. Sword replied. He turned to the rest of us. I'd like to introduce our new student, everyone. This is Rose Holland. The girl put up a hand, self-consciously. It was that moment, that terrible, blood-freezing, ashy mouth moment when you suddenly realize that 60 eyeballs are fixed on you, deciding what to do about you, where you fit in. I gave the new girl a smile, just a small one, to let her know we weren't so bad. She didn't smile back. Rose comes to us all the way from the Windy City. I'm surprised the wind could carry her. Somebody, probably Jason or one of his friends, whispered from the back of the room. Okay, most of us weren't so bad. Excuse me, Mr. Sword said sharply. Whoever it was didn't bother to repeat it. Mr. Sword turned back to the doorway. You can take any open seat, Rose. I looked around. There were three empties. One of them was on the other side of me. She took the one closest to the door, and I felt a tinge of relief. It would have meant something, her coming all the way across the room just to sit next to me. Maybe not to her, but to everybody else. This week, Mr. Sword said, already moving on, though most eyes were still on the new girl, we will be starting our unit on Elizabethan drama. Raise your hand if you are already an expert on drama. Half the students groaned and raised their hands, some of them pointing to each other. I nodded to Dee Dee, encouraging him to raise his hand, too. But he just gave me a dirty look. I noticed Wolf was still looking at Rose. His eyes were fixed on the front of the room. The rest of you are lying, then, Mr. Sword told us. I think most of you create more drama in one day than Shakespeare could imagine in a lifetime. But when, did he, when he did it, at least, it was all in good fun. To prove his point, Mr. Sword launched into a lecture on Elizabeth, Elizabethan theater, which was actually pretty boring until he described how actors would fill animal bladders with sheep's blood and keep them beneath their stage clothes so that they would explode in a gruesome display during fight scenes. Sometimes, he said, if you were one of the lucky ones sitting up front, you'd get some of the blood on your clothes, too. He called it the 16th century splash zone. Sheep's blood? 
Christina Morrow said with a grimace. Gross! She pronounced the word as three syllables. Gross! I think it's cool. I looked at the girl by the door, cheeks still pink, eyes still fixed on Mr. Sword. All the girls sitting near Rose Holland recoiled, wrinkling their faces. Beth Strands even scooted her desk over an inch. Mr. Sword made a motion for Rose to elaborate. No, I mean, it's really creative. Like special effects, Rose added, before there was even such a thing as special effects. And the audience would agree with you, Miss Holland, Mr. Sword said, smiling. All that gore helped to account for the theater's popularity. It wasn't a good drama if somebody didn't get stabbed, hanged, or poisoned by the end. Preferably all three. The audience was always out for blood. People were still eyeing Rose. A couple of the girls in the back started whispering no doubt about her. What she said, how she looked, her clothes, her hair. Dee Dee scrawled something on a yellow sticky note. He had a stack of them sitting on his desk. He handed it to Wolf, and I leaned over to see. Guess things haven't changed much, the note said. Dee Dee glanced sideways at the new girl. I smiled. Wolf didn't. No blood yet? Just dirty looks. If Rose noticed the reaction of the people around her, she didn't seem to care. Or maybe she was just good at ignoring it. Not an easy thing to do. I told myself to stop looking her at her, just in case she got the wrong idea. So the next chapter will be called The Promise, and we'll end on page 53. So um, go ahead and head over to Schoology, Schoology and we'll have a discussion. <laughs>